came together a new route to your home. Um, I will reiterate, as I always do, please tune in here to get your mail. The next few weeks are going to be very, very different. Uh, the pace is rise, the organizations rise, the unfortunate new dress code rise, the fear of my own rise of future. So the best thing you can do in order to stay calm is to stay informed. And the best way to do that is to get to know Joe here at our office. Uh, today I'm very sad to report that we had our fourth death as a result of coronavirus. We have 114 new cases in Rhode Island, bringing our national total of 408 cases. And we have 41 people in the hospital bed. Again, as I said, we are keeping our eye firmly on the hospitalization number. That's a number we know with certainty. And it's starting to climb. It's climbing at a fast rate. And so we are, by all measures, by all accounts, we believe we're in a fast spread of the virus at this point in the game. What that means is, right now, more important than ever, at any time, that we really stay constant, we really obey the social distancing rules, the hand washing rules. Yesterday, I asked all the people at the office to make a list of the five people you will be with and really, really try as hard as you can. That I would be back today on Monday with an important update on schools. And so this morning, uh, this afternoon, I'd like to uh, mainly focus my comments on schools. It's a huge issue. It touches 142,000 children and tens of thousands of families, teachers. So I'd like to take the next few minutes to lay out our plans around K through 12 public education and how we're going to handle it in the coming weeks here in Rhode Island. I will say, um, it is hard to believe that it was only two weeks ago that I announced we would be moving to distance learning, and it's, we've only been doing it for one week. I know certainly for, for me, it seems like it's been much longer, and probably for every parent and student and teacher out there, it feels like we've been at this a lot longer than just one week. So I'd like to begin by thanking you all for your hard work and dedication. There, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. There's nothing easy about this. It's difficult, it's disruptive, it's particularly difficult for the most vulnerable, but as I said when I made the decision, some learning is better than no learning. I am not throwing in the towel and giving up on 140,000 kids, and everyone, we all need to do our best to learn as much as possible so nobody gets too far behind. Uh, I will say, um, I am thrilled with how well it's going. Uh, I think it's going better than anyone could have anticipated, certainly better than I would have anticipated. I've been in touch with many superintendents over the past week. Uh, our commissioner, Commissioner Infante Green, has been in touch with all of the superintendents. She and her team at RIDE are doing a terrific job. Attendance rates are higher than we would have thought. In many cases, in some cases, attendance rates are higher than they, they are um, in distance learning than they have been typically at, with the at-school learning. Um, and 97% of school leaders report communication with teachers are going well. So uh, because of your hard work and this success, today I am announcing that we in Rhode Island will continue with distance learning through the end of April. So for the entire month of April, school buildings will continue to be closed, but school is in session. I want all the students to know this. It's not vacation. School's still happening. My kids say to me, is there school tomorrow? Yes, there is school tomorrow and every day till the end of April, but you're going to do it at home, distance learning. Not the school buildings themselves will be closed. Uh, many of you are saying, why don't I do it for longer? The answer is because I am taking an incremental, day-by-day, week-by-week approach with this whole crisis. This crisis is changing incredibly rapidly. Uh, even through the weekend, we're starting to see that we're going up the curve very fast. So as a result, I'm going to take it, in this case, 30 days at a time. If, it, if April goes as well as the past week, 
I very likely may say we're going to do it again for the month of May. But for now, I am confident, based on every piece of information I have, from teachers, superintendents, parents, students, principals, the commissioner, that we've got it in us to do this for the, for the next month and to do a great job at it. I will say, I cannot say thank you enough. I cannot thank enough the teachers and principals who are making this happen. You are innovating, you're working hard, uh, you're making me proud of you. And, and, and to the students, I know this isn't easy. You know, it, it, it kind of stinks not to be able to go to school and see your friends and hang out with your friends, for the little kids, you know, having recess with your friends. To the parents, it's brutal <laughs> to have to try to juggle everything and be with your kids at home. But it's the best we can do right now. And the good news is it's going well. The kids are learning. The kids are learning. And the other good news is this isn't forever. Hang in there a little longer, and we're going to get to the other side of this. And one day soon, we'll be back to normal. I've, uh, the following stories, I've been overrun with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories, all, all excellent and heartwarming about how distance learning is going. But I thought I'd share a few so the rest of Rhode Island has a, has a chance to see what I've seen, which is just terrific cooperation. So at Central Falls High School, coaches have started a push-up challenge to keep students active and engaged at home. I love it. I think we should all participate. Um, in Pawtucket, educators are posting a video every weeknight of a different teacher reading a bedtime story. It's adorable, and we want to thank you for that. We have a music teacher at Mount Pleasant High School here in Providence sending home audio files and planning to use video conference tools so the school chorus can sing together. And we have special education teachers at uh, Nathaniel Green Middle School putting together unique learning packets and hand delivering them to families. So again, there's, it's pretty cool what's happening, the innovation that's happening. There's no, no one size fits all solution. In some cases, it's, it's packets delivered by paper. In some cases, it's video conference. By the way, there is no substitute for the teachers who are just picking up the phone and calling the students and checking in. And I know that's happening. Uh, we're going to continue to integrate teachers' assistants. They are doing a great job. We want to, we want to in the next month, we want to fully in integrate all the staff at the school, not just the, the frontline teachers, but coaches, guidance counselors, social workers, therapists, student assistance counselors, and again, thank you to all of you. Uh, and I, I want you to know you're doing a great job. I do want to take a second to especially thank and recognize our brand new uh, Providence Turnaround Superintendent Harrison Peters. Harrison came here from Florida to run the Providence Turnaround just a few weeks ago. He knew he was getting into a challenge when he got here. I don't think he knew he'd be dealing with a turnaround and COVID in the first few weeks of setting foot in Providence. I want to say he's doing a fantastic job. I've been in touch with him. The commissioner stays in touch with him. Under his leadership, he has already distributed over 10,000 Chromebooks to families across the city. And when I last talked to him, he told me that it was his goal to have made contact with every single um, student and parent in the district. Uh, I think by last Friday. So Harrison, I'm glad you're here. You're off and running and keep doing a great job. Uh, so let me say this. Um, it's only because of the incredible work of everybody that I have the confidence to say let's keep going. And I, and I actually hope that at the end of April I can say uh, we're doing even better, we've learned more, and it's even smoother. To get from here to there, there will be many ups and downs, and many glitches, many moments of frustration, many moments that you're going to want to throw in the towel. This is too hard, and I'm just, I'm just asking you to power through it for the good of the state, to keep us all healthy, safe, and alive, and for the good of these kids. So thank you. Two, two particular announcements, uh, re continuing on with the education theme. This crisis is hitting all of us hard. 
it is hitting the most vulnerable especially hard. If you are living on the edge already, in poverty, on the edge of poverty, um, it, 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 this, this crisis is devastating. To that end, I want you to know my goal with distance learning is to make sure we're bringing everybody along. And that means everybody. That means the kid who's not wealthy enough to have Wi-Fi, the kid who doesn't have a smartphone, the mom or dad who can't be there every day, all day, coaching their children. We're not there yet. It's not perfect. But we're working day and night, and the commissioner is committed to this as well. When we say equity, we mean equity. We mean everybody. And we are going to work to make sure all of our students are brought along. To that end, we know not every student has access to Wi-Fi at home. And my team has been working truly nonstop to find solutions. Today, I'm very proud to announce that all households that have a smartphone with a Wi-Fi hotspot feature and have cell phone service from the four most common providers in our state, Verizon, AT&T, AT T-Mobile, and Sprint, you will now be able to activate hotspot service for free. There'll be no activation fee, no usage fee, no overage fee. So if you have a phone in your house, a smartphone that, that you can enable a hotspot, go ahead and turn on your hotspot. You can use your hotspot for free until May 18th. It's not perfect, but it's something. I want to give a huge thank you to uh, my Deputy Chief of Staff, Kevin Gallagher, who's worked especially hard on that, and a huge thank you to those service providers for uh, being generous and enable this to happen. Now, I do have a favor to ask of every other Rhode Islander. It's free hotspots for everyone, but please don't rush out right now and go turn on your hotspot. I can see my kids, if they're watching this, immediately getting excited and turning the hotspot on. Please don't do that, because then we'll crash the system. The whole point of this is to make the hotspot available as an option for people for whom it's their only option. So uh, everybody out there, if you're struggling with Wi-Fi, starting today through May 18th, use the hotspot technology at no cost. Having said that, even with that, there'll still be some folks left behind. So. We've also, in addition, partnered with Cox to close that gap. For qualifying low-income families, Cox is offering two free months of internet service and then $10 a month after that. So, and then for anyone who doesn't qualify um, for that but you're in the Cox service area, Cox is also offering one free month of internet. So. And I want to thank Cox. Thank you, Cox, uh, for doing this. Cox, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and Sprint, you guys are fantastic. You're pitching in, and I want to thank you. I know that was a lot of information. Don't worry if you didn't get it down. Here's the bottom line. If you're at home, you don't have Wi-Fi, you don't have a cell phone, you're confused, and you're not sure what to do, call your teacher or call your principal and say, you know that the state is now making available free Wi-Fi, fr free internet, and different options, and just figure out with your teacher and principal what's the best option for you. Again, I'm trying to take a little bit of the pressure off, so I hope this is one way that we can help make sure nobody's left behind. Uh, now for a little fun, uh, April starts in a couple of days, so I, you know, I hear from a lot of people, you know, hey Gov, it's not just technology, kids can't, kids can't be on screens all day, distance learning can't just be about computers. I agree, I agree fully with that. There's such value to just picking up a book, picking up a newspaper, picking up a magazine, and reading it. And by the way, we know that's what all the research says. Read, 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 read. For April, and as long as we're doing this, 
as long as school's not technically in session, the most important thing we can do for our kids is make sure they read. So I am I'm challenging all of us, everybody in Rhode Island, particularly the K through 12 school children, I'm asking you to read every single day in the month of April. How much you read is, is up to you. It depends on you and your teacher, your parents, and your grade level. But ev I want everybody reading every single day in the month of April. It's a challenge. We're calling it the April Reading Challenge. It's going to be run by uh, RIDE, the Department of Education. Uh, and for those of you who might be listening to this and saying, I can't afford books, I don't know where to get books, stay tuned for details. They'll be on the RIDE website. Your teachers will tell you about them. We have a whole system we're putting in place. Uh, I'm getting donations for books, donations for magazines. Libraries are offering, they're going to be offering um, kind of drive-through pickup service for books. So let's make this as fun as possible and challenge ourselves every day in the month of April. Do a little bit of reading. It's, it'll be good for the mind, good for the soul. And thank you to everybody in advance uh, who is helping us set this up and to everyone who's going to help us make it happen. This was all a mouthful. I realize I've just thrown a lot of information at you to, to parents and children. Um, and I also know there's a lot of change that I'm throwing at our kids right now, and it's not easy. You know, if we adults feel our tension rising, our anxiety rising, a sense of insecurity, um, you know, my, my children are saying, Mom, when's this going to end? How long do we have to live like this? So to that end, I think the best thing we adults can do is, is talk to kids and try to answer these questions and let them know it's completely normal that we're all feeling this way. But also, I'm going to be having a special press conference on Thursday with Commissioner Infante Green and Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott. It's a special press conference just for kids. Um, students can fill out a Google form to submit their questions, or you can leave us a voicemail with your questions. We are going to distribute this information to teachers. So your teachers will be telling you this week how you can participate in the press conference. But just, just start to think about it. If you're worried, if you're confused, if you have some advice for me, uh, I would encourage you to send us your questions. And on Thursday, uh, the three of us will be having a special press conference just for the kids, and I hope it helps, and I hope we have some fun. Last note, unrelated to schools. I want to take a second to address the issue of testing. As I've said the past two days, I'm trying to get us to a place as fast as possible where we can test at least 1,000 Rhode Islanders every day. We are not there yet. We're about halfway there. Uh, I'm hoping to say by the middle of this week, we're at 1,000 per day. In order to set that system up, we have set up several new um, drive-through testing operations operated by the National Guard at URI, CCRI, and RIC. I want to make something very, very clear. This is good news. This is great news. And thank you to the Department of Health, the National Guard, URI, CCRI, and RIC for your cooperation. It's going to get us to 1,000 this week. Do not show up without an appointment to one of these testing centers. You will not receive a test. You will waste your time. You will waste the time of people testing, and you will slow up the whole system. Right now, from this point forward, as of now on Monday, if you think you need to be tested, you must call your primary care provider. You can then, through your primary care provider, make an appointment to be tested at one of the drive through centers. If you do not have a primary care provider, you can call an urgent care center. If you don't want to or don't know how to do that, you can call the Department of Health hotline. Any one of those um, primary care provider options will, tr will ask you questions about how you feel, and if they think it's necessary for you to be tested, they can right there make an appointment for you to go be tested. 
do not show up. I know on the news there's been pictures of these new drive through centers. That's great. Do not show up without an appointment to one of the drive through centers. Um, because if you do, it's going to slow us all down. By the way, if you're sick, you should be staying home. In the coming days, I'm going to be giving some tough news, I predict, around the rate of increase in these cases. The best thing everybody can do in order to help us out and slow down the, the spread is to stay home if you are sick, to abide by the new social distancing regulations, to wash your hands, to stay calm and stay informed. So in addition to the fact that if you show up at a testing center without an appointment, you're not going to be seen, if you have any symptoms, you need to be at home. Um, and most certainly you cannot be going to work or uh, really even trying to interact with anyone in your family. Try to isolate yourself based on your symptoms. Um, I will give much more information tomorrow and in the coming days on our new testing systems, our protocol, and also what we're doing to ready the state generally around, around uh, capacity in our healthcare system. But for now, uh, I'm going to limit the testing announcement to that. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott, and then I'll come back with, question, with answers for questions. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. As the governor said, we have 114 new cases of COVID-19 in Rhode Island. This brings our case count to 408. As the governor has also said, we have very sadly one additional COVID-19 associated fatality in Rhode Island. That brings our number of fatalities to four. This most recent fatality was a man in his 70s. Among the things we are looking at right now is whether any underlying medical conditions were factors in his passing. Our deepest sympathies and prayers are with this man and others' families. This person was not a nursing home resident, but there was a lot of news coverage about nursing homes over the weekend. So I do want to address that quickly right now. Nursing homes are places of concern because you have a lot of people living in one congregate setting. And because those people are more vulnerable to the complications of COVID-19, it makes it a top priority for us to address effectively. Like many other states in the country, Rhode Island has had cases in nursing homes. We've had, we have had approximately 15 cases in three different nursing homes. In response, we have been working very hard at the Rhode Island Department of Health, across state government, and in the community to make sure additional steps are being taken for this population and with these important facilities. For example, we are looking at the discharge process when someone goes from a hospital to a nursing home to prevent any transmission in the nursing home setting. We're also looking at environmental cleaning. It's critical for nursing homes and other healthcare facilities to clean regularly, ideally every four hours really focusing on high touch surfaces like doorknobs and railings. That means using EPA registered hospital grade disinfectants on those high touch surfaces that exist and on shared resident care equipment. This is the same cleaning every four hours that should be happening in all healthcare facilities as well as in all facilities where there's critical infrastructure and workers throughout the state. And of course, it is essential, it's critical that all healthcare workers stay home if they are sick and that they practice social distancing, which means keeping a six foot distance from others. 
Finally, we're excited about the expansion of testing through the additional sites that the governor mentioned. Many people have been working very hard on this for quite some time. The process for getting tested is the same as it has been throughout this response for you as members of the public. If you think you need medical care, call your doctor. Do not show up. It's important to use the phone before arrival at any healthcare facility. If you don't have a healthcare provider, call an urgent care center near you. Community health centers near you are also an option so that everyone can receive the care they need, starting with a phone call. The healthcare provider you talk to will determine if testing is appropriate for you. If that is the case, you will be directed to a testing site. So the key is to call your provider to get the determination. We have been speaking regularly to healthcare providers. They now have the algorithm of patients. We have an expanded list of priority patients. So be patient and work with your healthcare provider to, to, de to determine the testing approach. If you just show up, you are not going to be tested, as the governor mentioned. And you are going to potentially expose yourself to other people who are symptomatic. As we have been saying, we want to expand testing so we can start pinpointing our response more. But please understand, whether you are positive by testing or whether you have not been tested and have symptoms, the actions you will be directed to take are going to be exactly the same. The treatment is the same. If you are sick, even if you think you just have a cold, you need to stay home. You need to stay away from other people. You can call your provider and your provider will direct you to a testing site if it's appropriate. Over the course of this week, the number of people that fall into that criteria will expand, but we're taking that step by step. If your provider directs you to an appropriate site to get a specimen swab to be tested, then you can leave the home for that and then return directly home. We need everyone who has symptoms of illness to stay home and to stay away from other people. This even includes the people you live with. To the extent that you can, keep a distance from them within your home and use separate living spaces, such as a separate bathroom if that exists, take turns if it does not, and do what you can. The people in your life as well need to be protected. Another key point is if you are sick with symptoms, the people you live with also need to stay home and self-quarantine, which means monitor themselves for symptoms so that if symptoms were to develop in those folks, they are not out in public, out and about, and increasing the risk of transmission to others. We are at a very critical phase right now and need everyone to do their part to help us as a state manage this public health crisis. We're working closely with our healthcare facilities to make sure that the system needs to be where it should be. You're seeing what the numbers are. It's critical for you as members of the public to follow. We cannot have just 50% following the stay at home order. We need 100% of people to do that. And as you're doing it, think about your neighbors. Think about seniors who may not be able to leave. Think about people with disabilities who may not be able to leave. Think of your neighbors and see, call them, see how they can be helped, see how you can help set up a food delivery service for them and make sure that they have the essential services they need delivered to them as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to the governor so we can get started with questions. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. And to everyone at home, we begin with, should the General Assembly be making plans to meet remotely or maybe somewhere large as suggested by Rhode Island Republicans? 
the thought of them meeting in person right now is not a good thought. That, I think, would be a terrible idea. Uh, I will say, regardless of how large the building is, the entire point of this is no gatherings beyond five people. I would say, as a general matter, the General Assembly has been terrific. I've been in practically daily contact with the Speaker and Senate President. They moved very swiftly last week to approve um, a line of credit, which we have gone on to execute, and they've, they've been great partners. So at this point, I don't see any need for them to convene, and they've both been very clear to me that if I need them to convene, they'll do whatever it takes. So I think we're in a good spot. The best thing they can do is stay home themselves and just provide information to their constituents, and I appreciate their support. They've both said they'll do, with, do what's needed when the time comes. In a similar question, will municipal boards and commissions, council and so forth, be exempt from the five-person grouping directive? Our local boards are trying to work out some systems so as to proceed with the budget and other business. I would encourage you to do it all uh, by phone or virtually. The reason that I suspended the open meetings rules and requirements is so that you could do this all via video conference or um, phone call. So that's the way you should be doing it. If, for whatever reason, you absolutely must meet in person because it's, I don't know why you would, but if you have to meet in person, then you have to do it where there's a minimum of six feet in between everybody, an opportunity for everybody to wash their hands constantly, and absolutely 100%, no one who's sick, even a little, can be present at the meeting. Governor, how many ventilators does the state have to help hospitals if the need arises? So prior to this, we had done well as a state in maintaining our ventilator supply. There were over 200 um, ventilators available. We are working very hard to get closer to an additional 600 ventilators to get us what we need. And there has been progress in getting us there. The next question is what is being done for home health care workers doing their jobs afraid to bring virus into their homes? Any temporary housing plans? There is work that's going into um, healthcare workers being able to have a place to uh, quarantine and monitor uh, for symptoms so that they can conti continue to work. Um, we want to support people who can um, do it by still living at home safely, but want to also be able to accommodate healthcare workers and other critical infrastructure workers who need to be able to have a place to quarantine separately. The next question is about the testing. Will CCRI and Rick Seitz be using the new front of nose swab? Will Rhode Island be getting any of the rapid AVID laboratory tests? If not, why? And also, as urgent care centers do not accept patients without insurance, they refer back to the emergency rooms. So we are looking to use all of the swabs that we have available to be able to get the testing done. There are nasal pharyngeal and many oral pharyngeal swabs. We want to activate all of them so that we can test, get specimen collected for testing of as many people as possible. We are also working very hard to get the rapid point of care tests available um, as a state. Uh, we know that that will help us expand capacity and there is deliberate work being done to address that. Um, Thank you to Commissioner Marie Ganim. Thank you to our insurance uh, partners. We are working to make sure that all patients, most of whom are insured, thanks to the work um, the, of the folks that I just mentioned and the governor, um, will have access to the care they need, both at urgent care centers as well as at federally qualified health centers. I'm not sure who would handle this next question, but how long will you need to test at a thousand per day rate in order to get the information we need to reopen the economy? Yeah, yeah, it's very difficult to say. Here's how I would, um, it, it, the, because it depends on how well people continue to do social distancing and how well we kind of clamp down on our social interaction. If we do that, we can level out the spread of the curve. If we don't, then it's just going to be more difficult, take longer. 
Before reopening the economy, I would want to see things like, um, you know, uh, hospitals having adequate capacity. So right now we're spending an awful lot of time trying to figure out how to put capacity into the system. You know, we're thinking where can we get another 1,000, 2,000 hospital beds. So before I could even think about reopening the economy, I'd have to see the hospital census back to some sense of normalcy and making sure that we have plenty of um, capacity in the system. I would have to be sure that we uh, have all the PPE that we need for many months. We'd have to be sure that industry by industry, we have a new set of rules for how we're going to live in the new normal. By the way, that requires equipment. If one of our new rules is testing the, taking the temperature of everybody before they go to work, it means I'm going to have to be comfortable knowing that we can procure a large number of thermometers. So that's a long answer but I want to give you a feel for the kinds of things that I will be looking at. You know, I will note that President Trump yesterday extended the uh, social distancing out until the, end of next, until the end of April, so I think that should give you a strong signal that um, we're, we're in this for at least another month while we try to figure out uh, how to get a handle on it and then can think about reopening the economy. The next question asks, with big box stores open because they carry needed items, though they are also have items mom and pop stores that are closed feature, is there more you can do for closed local retailers? And it goes on to say, in many cases, they may usually sell to an older clientele, probably who are not comfortable with online shopping. So we are, we are trying. You know, it's very difficult. Uh, we are encouraging small shops to be as innovative as possible. I know that some of them have themselves started a delivery service. You know, that's a smart thing to do, to figure out a way to do delivery. Um, I cannot, under any circumstances right now, allow these non-essential retailers to open their doors because we just saw too many people coming in and congregating. And as you say, older folks in particular cannot be exposed to the risk of coming in and congregating. If they, if they don't now know how to sell their products online, call 521-HELP. We're spending a lot of time getting small companies up and running um, to sell online, to do, to do their interactions virtually. If they want to be creative, I'd encourage it. If they need technical assistance, call us. If they want to set up a delivery service, that's another option. Also, the new unemployment insurance benefits will now start to apply for the small business owners and the self-employed, which is new. And so that's about the best we can do. Those folks can now collect unemployment insurance, whereas typically they wouldn't be able to. And will TCI benefits be extended since students are staying home for four more weeks? TCI benefits will be ex extended, but I do want to clarify this. Um, sorry, I got confused with TDI. So the answer to that is yes. I apologize. The next question, are you now seeing a surge in sick people going to the hospitals? Are there still enough beds? Are patients with COVID-19 allowed to go to nursing homes and rehab facilities straight from the hospital? And you did touch on this. I did. So we have 41 who are hospitalized now. Um, prior to expanding the testing today, we have been focused on people who are hospitalized, healthcare workers, and congregate setting workers. So that, those are going to be the numbers that we will see. As we expand testing, we will um, see more people outside of the hospital that are identified as positive. There are still enough beds now. Um, we certainly need to plan for uh, the increase, especially knowing how critical it is for people to follow the communi community mitigation directives that we're doing so that people um, where our health care system is able to um, withstand the increase that exists. And I think I got all of the questions. The next question is, how is distant learning working for English language learner students? Yes. I'd like to give Commissioner Infante Green a chance to answer that question and also offer a few remarks. I would say her leadership in general through this crisis has been extraordinary, and I want to thank her publicly and her team for all the hard work they're doing. 
So all students, including English language learners, are receiving the services as well as the supports that they're entitled to. And teachers have gone above and beyond to make sure that that's happening every single day. Next question is for Dr. Alexander Scott. An employee at the Rhode Island Veterans Home was diagnosed with COVID-19 over the weekend. A spokesperson said six other employees with potential exposure were told they can work while wearing a mask and should only quarantine if they show symptoms. Does this conflict or align with your messaging? Uh, thank you uh, for that. We want people who have been exposed to quarantine. That's the um, bottom line because it's important to be able to monitor for symptoms, preferably at home. When you have critical infrastructure employees who are needed to help care for people in um, a healthcare facility or a congregate setting facility, we have to approach it differently because we need the facility to have the healthcare workforce they need to function. So in those cases, when they're not able to quarantine and self-monitor at home. We're working very closely with the healthcare facility to monitor the staff on a very regular and frequent basis, even during the shift while they are there, and to wear a mask so that as they're monitoring themselves for symptoms, if symptoms were to start developing on their way, you know, to then leave and go home, the mask would prevent them from spreading anything to the um, patients that they are caring for. I also remembered the end of the previous question, which was, um, can people who are COVID positive return to a nursing home? And that I had addressed earlier in that we are evaluating that process. It's important to help um, protect our nursing home population against having people who are COVID positive um, returning unless the nursing home has a capacity to isolate that person after working closely with us. So that's something we're continuing to still monitor. The next question is very similar but different venue. One of the nursing homes said while 27 residents are quarantining, nurses had PPE and therefore are just being screened and monitored for symptoms. Should these healthcare workers be quarantining? Yeah, so the answer is the same as you mentioned. Quarantining is a key component that allows someone to self-monitor and determine whether or not symptoms occur. Because these are critical infrastructure staff and these facilities need to continue to function, we are approaching the quarantining um, in a very regimented uh, way for us to still be able to monitor them for symptoms, wear masks appropriately, and care for the, pe the persons who are vulnerable populations that still need the care they need. Next question asks, what would you tell someone who lives or works near the mobile testing sites if they have concerns about hundreds of potentially infected individuals coming into their surroundings each day? Um, I would say that we have uh, a very safe protocol that's in place. Um, these are mobile testing sites in the sense that people are staying in their cars and driving through these collection um, specimen sites. Um, we also have people in personal protective equipment who were there. It's a very um, well-run and safe process that's in place for uh, expanding testing. What's the status on the state's PPE stockpile? We're hearing from nurses who say they don't feel safe going into work. They are only given one N95 mask and they're being directed to use that one mask for multiple days. Why is this the case? Doesn't this put them and patients at risk? We are focused on providing PPE to healthcare workers in these high risk environments. Um, that's our priority uh, right now. Um, the governor has mentioned again and again that getting our healthcare workers and the amount of PPE that we need as a state um, is something that teams of people have been working extremely hard on. We want to make it so that every healthcare worker who is caring for patients in these situations have the PPE that we need. And we are competing against other states and countries 
to um, get us there. But you can certainly be confident that um, we have a very aggressive approach. We definitely understand the importance for healthcare workers to have the PPE they need and are going to keep pushing out um, the PPE to the healthcare facilities as soon as we get it, which we are um, focused on. Just to follow up, does it increase their risk to use a mask twice? It doesn't increase their risk. Um, and there are cursed conservation approaches that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have offered. We want to make it so that there's enough PPE to use it the way we normally use it, but until then, making sure that people are protected is the priority, and using the conservation approaches that we all are taking is, is critical. Thank you. Our last question today, are Rhode Islanders being tested for flu A and B before they are tested for COVID-19? How many flu cases are we seeing for folks who think they have COVID-19? So when it is appropriate, we want um, influenza to be uh, tested for if someone has symptoms that are consistent. We are not requiring a condition that in order to get COVID-19, you have to be tested for the flu, but we are certainly encouraging where it's needed. We are also not going by the condition that if you test flu positive, you don't have COVID-19 because it can happen where there is a co-infection. So they are both being addressed simultaneously. Um, we have not had a significant number of co-infected persons at this time. Other parts in the country have had that. It's something that we want to continue to monitor for, which is why we're not saying only test one or the other or that you can only have one or the other. Um, so being able to test for both is important. Overall, our flu season has passed its peak and is starting to trend downward. We are still widespread in terms of influenza at this time. There are a number of respiratory viruses that are out there. In addition to COVID-19, I'll again say the treatment is the same for all of them. Staying home if you are ill with any symptoms is critical. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor.